Rob Brown here, Peace Region Exposure. We've got another great interview this week with Trent and Lars, family man, about children's health care in the north. We've got another fitness minute with Devery, another drink with Nolan, another off-the-rails conversation with Robert Portman, and another movie talk with the guys at Macwood, Grady and Ryan. Welcome to Peace Region Exposure with Rob and Blake Brown. I'm your announcer James. We've got another convo with Robert Portman and another drink with Nolan. And an interview with Trent Larris about health care in the North, as well as more movies with those boys from Mac Will, Ryan, and Greedy. Another novel idea with writer Chuck Miller. And now on with the show. Peace Region Exposure, Episode 4. The journey continues. You made it. Thanks for tuning in. Another exciting episode is in front of you. This episode, in this edition, we've got an in-depth conversation, an interview with Trent and Lars, family man, father. He's going to be talking about health care in the North, specifically mental health care for children. And I have another conversation about writing and creation in the novel idea segment with American author Chad Miller. We've got the segments that you know and love. Blake, what are some of the segments we've got this episode? We have drinks with Noah. Mm. And what's he making for us this time around? He's making a Bloody Mary. All right. We also have a fitness minute talking about water. Hydration with our friends at Gridiron Fitness. All right. And we also have Grady and Wyatt from Macwood Film to talk about movies. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have Robert Portman, another minute with you bet. That's a runaway conversation. In fact, Portman it keeps it on film this episode as well. He's straight out of Compton, Blake. Episode four, away we go. We've got four faces for you, four T's. Tristan, Tyson, Taven, and Dad Trent. Is that right? That's right. So, faces of the North, interesting people, things that I find intriguing. We first met uh, a few years ago, but uh, one of the reasons we've had an ongoing relationship is uh, health access and access to health yeah. um, benefits, health services in northern British Columbia. Talk to me. As a father of three, how that goes? How yeah. That so uh, my oldest son Tyson here, um, he's been going through mental health crisis for a couple of years, and just to get access to services, it's uh, your waitlist plus. Uh, they lose, they lose your stuff and everything like that, like your requisitions from your doctors. Um, and there's just no coverage. You have to go down to Vancouver to get any access to services up here. Um, even for follow-up services after that, it's it's just a fight to get services and stuff like that. And it's not just us, it's lots of other families out there too, well, right? I mean, it's, it's something that, you know, wearing different hats, even on the political side of things, where we know the local RCP are, are getting called for mental health calls, where that's not their expertise. Exactly. Or business sometimes, it, same thing, because the adequate yeah. mental health yeah. services yeah. are just not available. Right? Yeah, we, that's right. We had uh, a call with the RCMP 
uh, had to come for a house, got escalated, things got escalated with mental health, right? RCMP came and basically chased them across with their police cruiser. And we went in and the watch com talked to the watch commander after and said, well, you know, we just don't have the training and resources to deal with mental health up here, like a big city like Vancouver, Kelowna, other places that you see that are more equipped to deal with it. And just to be clear, we were talking about the chase is on. We're talking about grown men, RCP, chasing the kids. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah, yeah. Not, chasing an eight-year-old across yeah. the, right? Yeah, no. Quite the scene. Oh, it is, right? And. And that must be like traumatizing, right? You know, uh, for somebody that age, right? When they're chasing them on his bike type thing across the thing, then we're in the hospital for seven days after that. You know, they tell you, oh, we're gonna send you down to Vancouver, you know, within a couple of days and everything like that. And oh, it's gonna be a few months, right? And this is the, right, the communication for it seems to, they don't know and the services aren't up here, so you have to travel for it. Um, and it's just, uh, the wait lists are terrible, and then getting back and having nothing still is just, uh, it's awful. Well, let's face it, even if the access was, you know, to Prince George or Frederick Stone, you're still talking about massive amounts of drive. Right. Your family your exactly, father. right? And there is really um, no funding for that because, you know, he's not dying. It's just mental health, right? He doesn't have something like cancer, or anything like that. You know, you get some travel assistance and stuff like that, but the bills keep rolling while you're away, right? Well, I can you remember, I'm to date myself, but I'm in my 40s, I can remember when mental health became an, yeah. not an issue, but something people would look at and take more seriously. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, just as a broken arm or a broken leg. Yeah, and um, they're starting to look at it more, and the big problem with it is access to, you know, doctors as well up here, right? Uh, especially, you know, we're talking youth mental health, but I also have you know, friends who are struggling with mental health as adults and they're saying, you know, I can't get to a psychiatrist because I can't find a family doctor who will refer me that well, way. Well, it's not to make light of it, but the same issue you would have if, if you're dealing with um, youth golf programs. Right. If you don't have a golf pro that's willing to teach youth to move up here, exactly. you still have that access to it. Right. Uh, they have, um, you know, they have the Northern Health Quick Line and stuff like that, which is supposed to alleviate access, but when it comes to more complex needs and stuff like that, they don't want to follow you long term because it could be a do different doctor you get on the phone every time, right? So they say if you can't get a family doctor, we'll call this line, right? Emergencies are just a band-aid to it, um, oh, let's face yeah. it, right? And so you go into emergencies, you spend four or five days with experimental uh, medications at this point, right? Because they don't know what they're... Yeah. Um, basically, it's different. Oh, we're going to try this out, see if it works. If it doesn't work, you'll end up in emergency again rather than doing a full psych evaluation and everything like that. Well, the other thing, too, I would imagine is you, the minute you're dealing with a, a child, you're, you're dealing with a, a limit. And that, not a limit that they age out, but you're dealing with a 12, 13 year old file that's, that's, right. that's always going to progress. Well, even staff don't last that long. Yeah. And then you're, you're, even if you had the staff, that's exactly still, it. the files being moved around. Right? And there's nothing up here, that, like for under 14, uh, closest place is Prince George. Uh, they have their APAU a unit there, their adult uh, adolescent psychiatric unit. Um, but that's only if you're under 14 you can get there. Anywhere else, it's BC Children's down south, and you're there three weeks to a month, and if they get the diagnosis wrong the first time, you're going back, right? Yeah, and that's time off and everything that comes with exactly. know, being employed. Yeah, uh, you know. both, they expend, expect both parents to come and get information is obvious because they want both to learn how to, you know, help deal with the child when there is an escalation and the best um, yeah. planning for them and everything like that. So, you know, both parents take the time off. Um, you know, your mortgage and your hydro and everything else. They don't so take time early. off. Yeah, exactly. No, right, and exactly. BC Hydro never has another hydro. Right, and then to have, you know, have to have a, a good employer who will allow yeah. you to take that time off too, right? You know, for several months at a time type thing throughout the year, right? No, nope, absolutely. Mental health issues, especially as it relates to children in the north. We're here once again at Gridiron. Every mm -hmm. talk about water hydration. What does that mean? So being hydrated, you definitely want to be make sh making sure that you're drinking water throughout the day. Um, honestly, not everybody drinks nearly enough water. Um, like two liters minimum a day is what I would recommend starting. So before breakfast, in between your snacks, lunch, um, and definitely bringing water with you at the gym it will prevent muscle cramps as well, especially if you're starting out working out. Um, here at Gridiron, so definitely fill up your water jugs before you come. 
Um, I always recommend getting a bigger water, water jug as well, so the more that you can carry, the better, um, especially to have like on your desk. When um, having a water bottle with your straw will definitely help you reach your water goals as well. Because a lot of times people just don't like lifting up their cup, and they just will bring it over with the straw and everything like that. So you talk about two liters, uh, just to quantify it for uh, viewers, how big is that as far as liters, a quarter liter, half a liter, what is that there? So this is about 750 milliliters, so I probably drink about, hmm, probably like six or eight of these a day usually. Get I'll on it. crush one of these in my workout for sure, so. Yeah, there you definitely go. want to be making sure that you're staying hydrated. And that's not hiding it and mixing it with juice or water or coffee or anything. That's just straight water, cold yep. water. Yep. We're going to be definitely. talking about fitness tips each segment, each episode, each time you tune in. So join us. Just jump right into it. I mean, uh, you know, how did you get started writing? Is it something that you just, books were uh, a big thing with you younger and, and you were, a, you know, a voracious reader or? Not reader well. Or? Not in the beginning. Uh, when I was really young, um, I equated reading with like schoolwork. So I avoided it. I hated reading. Um, but then, um, you know, a couple books that they make you read in school really got me into it, such as like To Kill a Mockingbird. And sure. um, uh, Frankenstein was a big one when I was younger. For sure. Yep. And um, so it got me into reading just a little bit. But once really college hit, that's when I started really reading for fun. Um, one of the first books I ever read was uh, Kurt Vonnegut's Cat's Cradle, and that it was such such a different way to to tell a tale. It kind of blew me away. But what really got me into writing, uh, my friend um, took a writing class in college, and it his story blew me away. It was more like a Ch uh, Jack Kerouac type of story, not the genre that I write in. Um, but I saw that he could do it, and mm -hmm. I was like, well, if, if I'm a reader and um, why not me? Uh, so I wrote my first uh, short story and probably looking back on it, it's probably pretty terrible. Um, but I just kept at it. And after 25 years, I is not just a hobby, just was more of like an identity of like who I was. Uh, so I just been crafting uh, my skills and honing my uh, skills for the last uh, 20, 25 years. And uh, here I am. And, and that's exactly it. I mean, it doesn't matter uh, where, how you start. The minute you start and finish something, and again, this doesn't even have to be writing. We could be talking about plumbing a toilet. Um, the minute you do it for that first time, it's going to inform the second time. And you're always going to learn from each one that you finish right. something, right? So I imagine every every piece of uh, writing you finish, and even in the midst of, there's always a lesson to be, and I don't mean you know it's a moral lesson or something like that, but there's right, a, a right. lesson on, on craft or how to do things better or different, uh, what works and what doesn't. And you just build it up over the years. And I mean, maybe some of it's ego, but uh, every time I write a new story or a new novel, I'm like, this is the best thing I've ever written. Um, but then you look back like 10, 15 years ago, I'm like, eh, it wasn't, wasn't that good. I've grown from there. So it, it makes utter sense because that every, if every, every new thing you start is the best thing, well, that's the next thing, right? Right, because you've grown from there. But then you go back and like yeah. 10 years ago, um, even though at the time I thought it was the best thing, yeah. and 10 years ago, I'm like, oh, wow, well, it wasn't it you know, wasn't the best and look where I've grown from there because but each could, step is. A but you can certainly see the, like in your own writing, the progression from when you did think whatever that piece was, was the best to the next thing you did to the next thing. And there is a building. Yeah. Well, there you of go. Of course. Uh, so I waited some time before I kind of jumped into it. Uh, but the way I wrote my first novel, uh, I wrote a short, began with a short story. Um, and at the time, just like we discussed, it was the best thing I've ever written. Yep. And even back today, because I wrote it maybe four or five years ago, um, even today is probably the best short story I, I have written. I, I think that holds from the day. And I didn't want it to end there. Uh, I saw the story and I was like, you know what? There, there I could, There's more to it. There's more uh, to the characters and there's more I could build off of. So it was kind of like a seed uh, that I created and I planted it and then it kind of grew into a novel and I kept on going with it. And then it became my first uh novel that i put that put out there and, and so right is, now it's published and then and just so we're clear that is prisoner of fear that's the prisoner of fear yeah yeah, yeah it, no, there we go. It, it, it began as a short story and the short story is called, called mother hen okay and um, even though it's not the short story is not technically in the book but there's a chapter called mother hen it's kind of like the, almost like the centerpiece to the whole novel and let's say if, if anyone has bought the books uh, for any author the biggest thing you could do for them is uh, leave a review good or bad let's say you give it one star that's fine. Yep. Um, be honest. 
um, but leave a review. Uh, that's huge for us. So I, I write at night primarily. Um, like I said, I don't get much sleep. So when yep. everyone's asleep, uh, I'll write. And then other th times when I'm picking up my girls from school and I'm in, sitting in car line uh, at school, I'll whip out the laptop. My girls take gymnastics class. So that's an hour where I almost 100% always write. Gotcha. Yep. Um, and it's hard because you have to turn the juices on. You have to be ready to go. Um, if you're not in that creative mood, you don't want to force it. Um, so sometimes, sometimes if that's the case, then I'll just edit. Mm. Away we right. go. It, the days of a worker are, are essential, uh, especially yep. when the kids are in school. So I write a lot more uh, during the school year than during summer, obviously. But uh, yeah, I always fit my time in. Um, at least once a day, I'm doing something regarding writing, the writing process, something. Well, that's absolutely, uh, absolutely a great uh, place to end this. Prisoner fear, and like you said, prisoner fear and paroxysm of fear are out there. But my next project that I'm writing is very exciting because I'm teaming up with five other authors and we're going to write in the same shared universe. And mm -hmm. it's uh, it's Western based. The universe is called The Barter Wars. And I'm writing a series of three novellas um, called Cerberus. And it's kind of like a spaghetti Western meets Greek mythology. So like I said, it's, it's way out there. It's way different than the, the last two that I worked, worked on. So it's coming out in March. So by the summer, um, it'd definitely be uh, out there. You know what? His manager was a tool. Yeah. Easy hey. manager. Yeah, what was his name? Anyway? No the guy with the gray hair. You remember watching that movie straight out of Thompson? I, I've seen that. And that came out. And like the kid that worked for Kellogg. And he said, well, we're going multi-millions. We'd like to, like, get you on board because you're going to make us even more millions. Yeah. The kid in Ice Cube's like, you fucking And he's, like, with the baseball bat. He's, like, Daddy, I haven't seen that since came out. You got to watch Straight Outta Compton. Straight up true shit. So, this time we're uh, going to talk about uh, favorite films of each of us. Grady, what are, uh, what are one or some of your favorite uh, films that pop up? Uh, first thing uh, that I think of when I hear favorite movies is The Graduate, directed by Mike Nichols, starring uh, Dustin Hoffman, Anne Bancroft, and Catherine Ross from 1967. I remember seeing this movie for the first time on Netflix when I was like 17, and it just blew my mind. Um, I, I, I love the comedy, the mix of drama, the uh, the, the classic late 60s, early 70s cynical sort of ending. Uh, I just think it's fantastic. I, I cry laughing no matter how many times I see it when Dustin Hoffman is uh, in the hotel uh, lobby talking to like Buck Henry and he's talking about like, I only have just a toothbrush to bring up and the bells hitting his hand and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, The Graduate is uh, probably my favorite movie. Though. One that pops up with me is uh, Roman Polanski's Frantic with Harrison Ford. The uh, reason I like that one, um, or this, this particular movie, it's uh, uh, certainly a left turn for Harrison Ford when he's in the mid 80s and arguably the biggest star in the world. Um, dealing with, arguably at the time, uh, barring in the mid 80s, maybe Kubrick, uh, the greatest director in the world at the time. And uh, very Hitchcockian, uh, very fish out of water, uh, where it's an American tourist looking for his wife who's been kidnapped after a bag exchange at the, at the airport goes wrong, uh, you know, or a pickup, not an exchange. And uh, at the time, I had been to f Paris, so I, when I watched Harrison Ford stumble around um, a little bit uh, through uh, the streets of Paris, I had been there, so I recognized the value of a, oh, that's a real set. Uh, I'd been, you know, very much like the, the forest of Endor, where I'd been in, in, in the forest before seeing Return of the Jedi, where it just made it more real to me. Um, or Superman too, when they're in, in Paris, when they'd be opening there. But uh, to me, Frantic is a very Hitchcockian uh, movie. A lot of humor in it too, especially at the, the expense of Harrison Ford not learning the language of the customs. And then in the second half, where he does a lot of pointing and yelling, um, uh, there's some more, a lot of humor there. And uh, great supporting turn by somebody who ends up uh, turning out uh, ends up being the director's uh, wife, uh, Emmanuel Senior. But fantastic movie and uh, good uh, good thriller. I didn't know I was going to need to know who was in my movie. Um, <laughs> oh, you got uh, Kevin Spacey. Yeah, I do have Kevin Spacey. <laughs> the only person I know. Uh, one of my favorite films has got to be 
uh, Baby Driver, um, an Edgar Wright film uh, starring Ansel Elgort and uh, Kevin Spacey. Just a tremendous movie all around, but uh, if, if you're looking for a good example of like sound design and incorporating music into your story, like everything is pitch perfect, like beat for beat. It is such a well-rounded movie. It's funny, there's tons of action, uh, the storytelling is phenomenal. Cinematography is terrific. Like absolutely, it is just a perfect movie. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. I feel like the real star of Baby Driver is Edgar Wright himself. Absolutely, like his direction. Like it's such an Edgar Wright movie. You know, certain movies just feel like you know we have a lot of major stars in it, but like a Tarantino movie is a Tarantino movie, and an Edgar Wright movie is an Edgar Wright movie, and I think Baby Driver's definitely in that regard. Absolutely, and yeah. it's an absolutely great movie. Yeah, mm -hmm. or film. Yes. You don't want to a motion it's picture. It's, 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 yeah, it's, an, yeah. it's an emotive, scientific motion picture. <laughs> it is. <laughs> on celluloid. <laughs> I don't know if they filmed on film, but... I don't think they did. He, um, Edgar Wright used film for The World's End, I believe, mm. uh, which was still a very recent film. Yeah. Um, but I, I thought it was so strange that mm. he would choose to work with film at that point in his career. Yeah. So maybe it's just something he prefers? Yeah, like a lot of filmmakers are just very like, this is like, even Ryan Johnson, who's a very contemporary director, he's like, I shoot movies on film. For the yeah. Like Fincher and Tarantino are certainly that as mm -hmm. well. And just not, they're not bending, whereas I can, yeah. I personally could care less, right? Yeah. <laughs> they I don't have the money to burn on films. So exactly. I like, I like the cheaper costs of just, you know, Hundreds of hard drives. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you do it. <laughs> so, stop the zoetrope and we'll. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> All right, peace, region exposure. That was episode four. We hope you enjoyed the adventure. I'd like to thank, of course, our segment guests, Mr. Portman, right here. Of course, Miss Gibson over at Gridiron Fitness, Grady and Ryan over at the Macwood Film Studio, and of course, Nolan for the Bloody Mary. Blake, anybody else we have to thank this episode? Uh, special guests Trenton Rose and awful Chad Middle. You bet. And we're also going to thank, of course, you're going to see her credits roll by in a couple seconds or so, but this entire episode was edited by Blake Brown. So thanks very much for Blake. We always, and to Blake, and we always wonder where the next episode is going to take us. Peace, region, exposure. Yeah, we got another episode wrapping out, and we need more content, so by all means, we're on our way. Shorty, grab our stuff. over at Gridiron Fitness. And we also have Grady and Ryan, right? It's Grady and Ryan. Never heard of them. <laughs> yeah, it's Grady and Ryan. Grady and Ryan from Macwood Films.
Welcome to Peace, Reason, Exposure with Robin Blake Brown and your announcer James.